So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sirpa Zimal, and on behalf of Switzerland Global Enterprise and also of Home of Blockchain, I would like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining this webinar on the topic of tokenization and digital assets. And in particular, we will discuss what Switzerland has on offer for blockchain ventures and look closer at the regulatory framework. So we are very pleased to have Danny Nelson from uh, Coindesk moderate the discussion. And before I hand over to Danny, um, here are a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we can show the slide. Um, so all the participants are muted. Um, we will record the webinar and the recording will be available um, afterwards. And if you have questions, we have time at the very end for to take a couple of questions. Please uh, put them in a chat function and we can take them at the end. So now, without any further ado, uh, Danny, I would like to hand over to you. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, happy to be here. And we're going to have a fun discussion today about uh, regulation in the Swiss context and how it applies to the crypto landscape, specifically tokenized assets and all that good stuff. We've got a very uh, good panel here really covering the gamut from the legal context to the uh, institutional retail investor facing and also uh, a speaker from the uh, project side who can actually attest to what it's like to be building startups in the crypto space uh, using the Swiss frameworks. So I'd love to just start it off by giving each of our wonderful panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, Marcel, uh, if you could start us off, just tell us what you're here to discuss today. Thanks, Danny. Um, hi all, good evening. I'm Marcel, I'm a Swiss lawyer. I'm 46 years old and I have two kids and I live um, close to Zurich. Um, I have to admit that I was working uh, for FINMA a couple of years and I was also with UBS, which is now really the largest bank in, in uh, Switzerland. But nowadays um, I'm responsible for a Swiss law firm um, here in Switzerland. It's a, it's a boutique law firm and we are highly specialized in providing advice to companies in in the blockchain in the blockchain sector that's me thanks cool ophelia um yeah hi uh, my name is ophelia i am the co-founder and president of 21 co um 21 co is the parent company of 21 shares we're the world's largest issuer of cryptocurrency etps we launched the first crypto ETP in the world um, in Zurich in 2018, and have since grown uh, to list 40 products across 12 different exchanges in eight countries. Um, our valuation is about $2 billion, and we're the largest uh, crypto unicorn in Switzerland. Um, and really, the, the products that we offer are designed to help uh, bridge the gap between traditional financial products and uh, crypto-based products for investors. Great. And then Austin, over to you. Hi, uh, I'm Austin Fothery. I'm the CTO at Origin Foundation. Uh, we are a Swiss foundation uh, out of Neuchâtel, and we build technology that helps tie physical and digital assets to uh, public records on blockchains that allows for marketplaces, uh, uh, operating frameworks, all sorts of services and additional tools built on top of certified uh, certificates of authenticity about products or digital uh, uh, digital assets. Great. And uh, Marcel, we'll stop, start with you. I think you're in the best position just to give us like a broad context to build the top. Could you talk, uh, tell us for a minute about uh, the Swiss legal position toward cryptocurrencies? Like how do regulators approach this stuff, and how does that differ from jurisdictions in other parts of the world? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Danny. I'm happy, happy to do so. So in, in Switzerland, um, the regulator has, has um, started quite early to be acquainted with the topic. So it all started here um, back in 2018 already, um, when FINMA published this um, nowadays famous ICO guidance. That was um, a time where all, um, say, a lot of jurisdiction ISOs popped up, and uh, no one had a clue how how to treat them from a legal or also from a regulatory perspective. FIMO was was quite brave and published this guidance um, early on. 
Um, since then, things have further developed here in Switzerland. And um, in uh, 2021, we have implemented a um, couple of, or we have changed, it's, it's not a new law, we have changed um, existing federal laws. In particular, it, it was uh, about um, 10 federal laws which were changed and were fine-tuned for, for the needs of um, blockchain companies. So that's also um, quite interesting because um, here we see that we not only have the regulator who has um, been um, very early in the space, but also the lawmakers um, who have introduced a couple of, of new changes in, in existing laws. And, and here related to the, let's say, the changes of the laws we, we have here clearly the Swiss way, we do not have a a blockchain or DLT isolated law. No, we took the existing legal landscape and have adapted um, it slightly to the to the changes um, or to the needs uh, for the, for the blockchain world. That's that's uh, that's a solid framework, and which leaves quite uh, quite some let's say um, interesting room, solid room um, to develop um, to develop uh, companies here in, in in Switzerland in this sector. And to bring it over to Austin, just uh, coming off that point, um, you're working, of course, in a company that is, you know, in the framework of a Swiss foundation. What what drove you to make the decision to domicile in Switzerland, other than, you know, the lovely weather and the mountain air? Uh, like, what does it, what does the Swiss context do for you that you couldn't find elsewhere? Well, the, the biggest selling point is that it's a regulatory framework which you don't have in most jurisdictions. Uh, the, the Origin Foundation, a lot of the ideas have been incubated over years and years um, through, you know, starting at major consulting agencies in the US and then trying to do it independently in the US and trying to work with corporations that uh, across industries that don't necessarily get along. And we, over a number of years, we ultimately found that the Swiss framework offered us two major strengths. The first being uh, that it was a regulatory framework that we could operate inside of. And then second of all, uh, the, the foundation concept inside of Switzerland gave us credibility when we go to these major corporations and uh, declare our neutrality and our, our desire to build for an industry. It, it helps us come across and, and convince these, these corporations that we're not competitors and we're not here to take their business. We're here to enhance the ecosystem and build technology that makes everybody's lives better. So, so for for you guys, it, it it's that it lends some credence to the organization. It's like, well, look, we are coming from a place where we know exactly where we stand in, from a regulatory perspective. You can trust us going forward. Exactly. I mean, being able to tell people that your token is is uh, uh, has oversight by FINMA and that your foundation is under their regulatory authority gives a lot of credibility when you walk into a boardroom and people are scared of this crypto stuff. Um, you know, being able to point to a government that actually has a framework uh, that's working and, and is in practice helps out quite a bit. And Ophelia, could you tell us a little bit about FIDMA? Like, you know, in the U.S., which I think many of our uh, many of our listeners are from, and I am as well, we have the, uh, the alphabet soup of different re regulators that we rely on uh, and look toward. In, the, in Switzerland, it's all about FINMA. So what is this organization and you know what, what is their remit? So it's actually, it's a little bit different than that in, in my experience. And I, you know, it should be obvious from my, my accent, I, I'm, I'm, I'm American, I, I grew up in the US and actually found myself building my company in Switzerland for a lot of the reasons um, that Austin mentioned. It, we, there's no regulatory uncertainty at home, and, and that goes unbelievably far in terms of actually being able to build sustainable businesses. FINMA is interesting because the Swiss regulatory landscape is actually structured a little bit differently than the US one is. Um, and having done like a bit of regulatory work in both, it the main difference is that there are a lot of um, FINMA not only has a lot of the authority in a more centralized way, they also delegate a lot of that authority. So for example, in our case, we spend a lot of time working with the exchanges, right? Which essentially have their own regulatory bodies within them. We spend a lot of time working with other players who have um, either sort of directly or indirectly oversight. Um, and I think one of the things that's different is there's no argument about 
there's no territorialism in terms of like who gets to make these decisions or, or how to think about that. You really are able to deal with things in a very pragmatic way. And, and that's overarchingly been my experience of uh, Swiss regulations broadly and also in the context of crypto. It's a very practical approach and a very um, first principles based approach and a consultative one, which is a completely different way of operating versus um, you know, the US and the SEC who typically either um, regulate via rulemaking or via enforcement, um, very different stylistically. So FINMA not only has a much wider purview, they also have a very different approach to how they actually implement that in practice. And Marcel, how would you characterize uh, how FIDMA approaches this industry? Is it like a conservative organization or is it more open to innovation than we might say the SEC might be? Mm -hmm. I think a, a regulator has to be conservative by by nature. It, it would be somehow strange if, if we would have a fancy regulator. This would not be super credible. So also also Finma Finma is kind of uh, conservative, but exactly as um, Ophelia has mentioned, I, I think um, you can really talk to this uh, gentleman, um, and it is um, or what we experience um, more or less on a daily basis is that um, we would like to get to 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 have problems solved. We 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 feel this approach um, very much also from 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 Finma. But here, maybe we, we have to differentiate a little bit when it's about new companies um, with new project. I think Finma is, is, is very keen to understand what they're doing. Sometimes we, we just try to introduce um, potential um, companies or potential clients to Finma. Finma is open to listen to that. Hey, why not, Marcel, um, if, if it brings us further to do it. But um, here comes the but when when there are problems, um, Ophelia, you have mentioned um, enforcement stuff, or if 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 it's about um, cleaning up legacy, then Finma can become really uncomfortable. Finma has 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 very far ranging powers when it is about um, um, let's say um, cleaning up problems. I have seen cases where the enforcement um, people were um, super fast and they they were not waiting too long and, and companies um, were closed. So I, I can translate it in a sentence or two. The offer is, is quite clear. Here it is, we have a stable legal framework um, with, um, uh, let's say, a, a highly educated regulator. But please use it and please play along along the rules. If you do not, so then it, it's it's just not okay. And then then the, the the climate changes quite a bit. And to relate this back to your initial point at the start of this uh, at the start of our panel, um, I'm trying to uh, think think about let's let's compare the Swiss approach to the U.S. approach. In the U.S., a lot of crypto companies will be uh, often say, well. You know the laws aren't clear, or we need new laws because uh, we we don't have the the guidance that is required. Whereas the regulators, particularly the SEC, says no, the laws are very clear. It's just you that isn't that aren't following them. In Switzerland, is it more so that this discourse has evolved to the point where the existing laws have been not um, amended or or fixed up or just changed a bit? to better fit the specifics of the crypto industry? Oh, uh, in my experience, it's actually different than that. Um, okay. It's sort of the, it's almost a different framing of the conversation. And I agree with what Marcel is saying. The regulators have an open door policy. Come and talk to us what you would like to do, and we will tell you how to best to do that. And there's a consultative process around how to best approach it, right? It's not a question of whether or not the law on the books is clear. If the law on the books is clear and you know exactly what to do, fantastic. If you don't know what to do, you can literally pick up the phone and call them. And they will work with you to make sure that there is clarity before you have to do anything. Like, hey, I, you know, I want to do this. I think it falls under that. There are these three provisions that I not sure how they would apply to this. Can we sit down and talk through it? Could you tell me what it is I should be thinking about? And they will actually do that. It's a completely different model. Um, it, it's not via rulemaking. There are rules, but the rules are used as first principles 
to say the spirit of the law is this, it's intended to do this. Therefore, in application, this is probably what we should be doing. And you can then have them check that with you and talk through it. And that process means that you, you don't end up with what you have in the United States, where regulators coming in after the fact and saying, you interpreted this incorrectly, or just read what we wrote down before. They'll actually have a conversation and say, yes, this is what we wrote down before. This is how it applies to you. Here, your interpretation is correct. Here, it should be slightly different. And that discussion is very different. It's a completely different relationship with regulators inside and outside of crypto. Like I have had similar experiences with everyone from the tax authority to, you know, uh, the cantonal office to everybody. It's just a very different way of approaching laws generally. And it translates to crypto really well, because what it means is when you're pushing the envelope of what a law was intended to do, so think like 33 Act, 40 Act in the US, were intended for a certain type of product. We're now launching things that are maybe adjacent, maybe not, maybe related, maybe not. Maybe it will work, maybe it won't. And the question becomes, the laws, the way they're written in the United States are not intended to be used as first principles to say the spirit is this, therefore that. Um, it's much more specific and like technocratic in that way. And so when you go to FINMA, you can actually say, hey, you guys said something 10 years ago about this thing. I wanna do this new thing. It's an innovation in these three ways. How do we actually assess that together? Mm -hmm. uh, Austin, do you have any quick uh, instances that come to mind where you had to go to FINMA and said, like, look, 10 years ago, you said this, just, just want to make sure how this fits uh, fits in with the Origin Foundation now. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think we we had a bit of a we had some rails in front of us. Uh, we depended uh, significantly on some of the work that was done around the Definity Foundation. Uh, they, they laid a lot of the groundwork there, so it was nice if you if you can find someone who's trailblazed a little bit, uh, they can give you a lot of guidance on who, who to go talk to. Um, where to get this done, which which Canton would be best, and and those kinds of things. So uh, for other people looking to do this, I think that's that's probably the best idea. Go find someone who's who's even if you have to veer a little bit at the end. You you can at least get eighty percent of the way down the tracks uh, of getting where you need to go before you have to sort of uh, make make a new space for yourself and and have those conversations. Uh, so, so that was that was fortunate for us that we we had that uh, very close the organization that we were very close to that we were able to follow right behind. Uh, but um, uh, yes, it's you know it was cer certainly an interesting process to go through and way easier than the the five other things we had tried in the U.S. before. And Marcel, for newcomers to Switzerland, I mean we've got 30, 40 people listening in. Presumably, some of them might want to understand better how to uh, jump in like what what are they what barrel are they looking down how long is it going to take for them to get set up in Switzerland what's the licensure process like just give us a taste mm -hmm. uh, here it, it, it really depends what we are talking about so um, let's say the, the licensing re regime which uh, Switzerland offers is, is is quite simple to understand we, we can we can divide this licensing topic into three buckets. It's about infrastructure license. That's what our stock exchanges are doing. It's about, let's say, FINMA or normal FINMA license, talking about banking license, fintech license, uh, security steel firm license, asset manager license, stuff like that. And the last um, bucket is um, the AML stuff. Um, the AML stuff is kind of outsourced uh, from FINMA and so-called self-regulatory organization are taking care that the um, AML um, regulation is um, being observed by, by companies. So it, here it really depends um, uh, whether the, the, the interested company um, falls on the bucket one, two, or three. So it's quite likely that we do not um, need bucket one very much because infrastructure topic, that's that's something super challenging. Uh, we are advising or have been advising um, um, SDX for, I don't know, four or five years now already. So that's really, yeah, infrastructure is something which that we can cover that um, on, on another um, occasion. Then this, let's say the the normal FINMA license. Um, here we have quite some movement. So we have on top of 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 let's say kind of a pyramid, we have the banking license. 
and followed by the so-called fintech license. The fintech license is becoming more and more popular. It has been quite, very quiet um, around the fintech license. And uh, not, why, why does it become more and more popular these days? It's because of these different changes in, in the federal um, laws I have mentioned. For example, um, the Banking Act has, has been changed and a new um, category um, or new wording has been introduced. We are talking about um, 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 crypto-based assets and, and, and here the, the the fintech license might play an interesting an interesting role. Um, that's one aspect. Another aspect is the securities firm license. Um, you can enable kind of exchange with a securities firm license, um, et cetera, et cetera. So here it really depends on um, what we're talking um, about. Um, let's say from the easiest point, the, the, the SRO, the AML license, or it's not really a license, it's more a membership. You, you, you can become a member of an SRO. There are several SROs, self-regulatory organizations in Switzerland within about one month. It really depends on, on how mature your company is. Do you already have process in place, policies, etc.? Then for this uh, FINMA license, um, securities firm, um, fintech, or even banking license, then it's getting um, it's getting more um, more difficult and it's more time consuming. I think it's it's realistic to say that you can get one of these licenses uh, within uh, one one um, uh, within a half half year, um, uh, six months up to nine, maybe maybe a year. So it's it, it but it really it, it really depends. We also. Um, we are advising currently um, five licensing projects in parallel. That that's massive um, also um, for us. And and here we we have um, some projects which um, are progressing faster faster, and others they might be stuck just for a, a little detail. One is currently a bit stuck because Finma um, wants to make sure that the, the key shareholder um, um, is fit and proper. So it really depends. So it's, it's quite difficult to say. I'm going to throw this over to Austin now. Uh, it just comes came to my attention in the course of this call. We had to have some uh, breaking news out of the U.S. that I think will be a good conversation starter for uh, us in Switzerland. Here, uh, the CEO of Sushi Swap, which is a decentralized exchange, has uh, is now raising money for a legal defense fund because, as he says in a, a forum post, he has been subpoenaed by the SEC. He doesn't say what the subpoena is for, but the uh, the important point is that we're now seeing uh, just another example of pressure being applied to the U.S. toward uh, decentralized uh, crypto startups projects. Um, Austin, as the as the one closest to that that world, although I would say Origins rather different from a, a decentralized exchange, but still, you know, from a, from a tech from a um, crypto ethos perspective, like is that something? We were, you would see in Switzerland, like is the regu are regulators just going out and subpoena, subpoenaing projects um, in order to bring them to the table? Uh, we, we certainly haven't seen that at Origin Foundation. I mean, we certainly have an open dialogue. Uh, when you sort of talk about those different levels of licenses as a foundation, um, it has been a process in having those conversations and figuring out how do we maintain our foundation status, versus what would we do that would make us have to become a bank and have to go get the banking license. And, and a lot of that affects not only how we market ourselves, it also affects what tech, you know, the, the technology that we build and how we build it and how it's deployed. There's some things that we can't deploy because it would sort of trip us over the wire and we would then have to go get a banking license which is not something that we particularly are interested in doing. We're, we're a technology company and uh, we're building a network. We're not trying to be, not trying to be a bank. So uh, it's, it's been a two way conversation in, in Switzerland uh, from everything that I've, I've experienced. And uh, you know, they, they, it, it, it also, because it's a, um, uh, not, not a smaller community, it's, it's it, People seem to know each other better. It's it's uh, it's a known business environment, and uh, the, the laws are known. So again, we're, we're sort of coming full circle here. Uh, people pick up the phone if there's an issue. 
um, you have a tax, you have a tax issue, and the office calls you and says, "Hey, you didn't didn't do this right. Here's how you do it, and you fix it." Uh, nobody it doesn't feel like anybody's out to get you. Uh, whereas here in the U.S., uh, you know, you you can have the best intentions at heart, and um, everywhere you turn, you know, no no lawyer will give you their blessing, and no legislator will um, uh, step up to bat for you, and uh, you're kind of on your own. You have to take all the risk. Uh, all the risk on your on yourself. So, um, you know, I hope I hope that doesn't uh, happen in Switzerland. I think it's I think it's that that the regulatory authorities do have to do their job and make sure we don't end up with a bunch of those uh, the, you know, rugs, as they call them, or uh, straight up scams or Ponzi's. Um, and and if, if we maintain reasonable regulation and collaborative regulation, uh, I think Switzerland is is an amazing place to get that done, and I certainly wish that the U.S. would um, uh, would follow suit and and figure out a way to enable our citizens and just the mind share that we have over here and 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 the creative entrepreneurial spirit we have. There's so many people that want to do things over here that just can't, and they hit walls and they go do something else. And now to switch gears a little bit and get uh, really in the weeds about how Swiss entities are, you know, tackling the uh, the freedom that they might find here. This month, the Swiss Banking Association uh, put out a paper, a, dis a white paper, discussing the feasibility of launch of issuing deposit tokens. Which uh, just uh, a quick summary of them: they would basically be some sort of crypto asset that is representative of one's deposits at the bank. Uh, this, these assets would exist in theory on a public blockchain, as you know, USDC and Tether and the other stable coins uh, might. But um, I'm wondering, Ophelia, if you could, uh, you, you know, we were speaking. You said you, you you're familiar with this paper. If you could just give us a primer on like what what this paper says about the state of Switzerland, that you know, the banking association is going out. On a limb here and saying, well, look, what if we made this innovation? So, what is the innovation, and what does it tell us about Switzerland? So, it's interesting. I think it it's a very, very Swiss approach to a central bank digital currency. is is how I interpreted this paper. It's a great paper. If anyone on this call has read it, it's worth taking a look at. Um, the it's not dissimilar from USDC conceptually, right? So. USDC, for those of you who don't know this, essentially relies on banks to custody assets and then issues tokens against that as a form of essentially depository receipt. And the legal form is different, but its function is largely the same. And so you are, are buying something that you expect to be fully backed one to one. Um, and that's sort of the way that this works. Uh, the, the Swiss Banking Association take on this, which was interesting, was actually more focused on creating uh, essentially a more decentralized version of that. And it's actually very reminiscent of how like companies like Six, which is one of like the key pieces of financial infrastructure in Switzerland were created. So if you think about Six as they, they own the stock exchange, they own Six Digital, which people might've heard of. They also run a lot of the payments networks um, and central clearing and the CSD and a lot of the securities data. They're, they're a key piece of infrastructure. If you actually look under the hood, they're owned by a consortium of all of the Swiss banks. Why do they do that this way? It creates a vested interest in shared infrastructure. And if you look at the approach that the Swiss Banking um, Association is taking, it's very similar in spirit. This idea that you can have fundamentally competitive entities come together, develop a standard, provide that sort of safety and security by virtue of doing it through that kind of consortium structure and actually create a form of central bank digital currency using the collective stability of all of the Swiss banks. It's not dissimilar from the way the six payments infrastructure was originally set up or the um, stock exchange was set up in Switzerland. And it's a very, um, it's very unique to Switzerland and it shows you why crypto has flourished there. It's definitionally community-based, right? This is about a community of banks coming together to launch something, but crypto has a very similar flavor to it. And a lot of the infrastructure that's provided that allows that concept of community to be important, that allows for dialogue with regulators, that allows for um, flexibility in that way and like cohesion in that way and, and collective decision-making um, and the idea of intent over 
specifics. Um, I think together you really see it in a paper like that. That's actually, if you want a microcosm of what makes uh, Switzerland from a regulatory perspective so strong in crypto, take a look at that paper. It's why, right? It, the, the legacy infrastructure is actually set up to be far more compatible with um, crypto as a business than other geographies are. And uh, Marcel, what of the discussions around a CBDC specifically, like uh, is is there a, a broad discussion about whether or not Switzerland should have um, a CBDC? I know that there have been in the past projects, I think one called Helvetica, that actually looked into how these rails might operate. But where does that discussion stand now? Let's say from a personal view, uh, please do the CBDC as, as soon as possible. It, it would um, give such a, a great boost to, to the industry um, here in Switzerland. So, um, it's, but that we, we might all be a little bit biased because we, uh, as we are working in this uh, industry. So CBDC, um, yeah, super, super, um, please do it. Um, but maybe there are also other other um, ways. Um, Fila, you you have uh, described that perfectly. How how yeah, that that what what the Swiss banking organization is suggesting is is not is not a, a CBDC um, by 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 Swiss national bank. So it's a consortium. So that that's an interesting way to to do a, a kind of workaround to a pure CBDC. And there are other other um, projects uh, around. And I'm I'm confident that we will have the sooner or later. It's more the sooner um, 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 CBDC like currencies um, available here in Switzerland. Maybe a little bit later. I have no clue when. Maybe also the Swiss National Bank um, um, comes into this place. So they, they, this projects you have mentioned, I was also part of of this. Um, let's say exercises. They they were. They were um, very um, successful, but I, I guess that uh, it's it's a highly political thing, and uh, yeah, very uh, yeah, it's a big decision for for a conservative organization as our Swiss National Bank can um, to pursue such an, uh, an avenue or not. But I'm I'm confident that um, this will come. But until we get there, we have um, a lot of other firepower um, in in our hands. Um, yeah, so but let's continue. And to follow up on that point, uh, Marcel, would a CBDC like compete with crypto, or is this going? Would this would this be a so a project that's completely separate from it? Like, sure, the industry is really excited for it, but why is the crypto industry excited for this? Is it going to be would would a CBDC be on in Ethereum? Would that even be something desired or possible from a, a central bank? Let, let, let's. I, I think it would be it would be a highly welcome add-on, not not um, uh, something which which competes um, the the crypto the crypto world. Let's have a look at the stock exchange, or at uh, in particular um, what um, SDX has has created. Um, um, so SDX has more or less um, duplicated the um, the already existing and very well functioning infrastructure we have here in Switzerland, managed by by six. And owned by the banks. What has um, been established lately uh, was a second stock exchange. Or oh, we have a survey also of the Bern Stock Exchange, which is doing quite fine as well. And we have established a second CSD. I mean, that's that's a fantastic thing. And it for me, it, it went quite, um, yeah, on, it, I wouldn't say under the radar, but it, it is a massive thing that that country doubles um, an already existing infrastructure for, for a specific industry as as um, uh, as the blockchain industry. And coming back to your question, Danny, why why is that interesting? Let's let's take a simple, a simple trade, whatever we want to trade. Uh, no, 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 XYZ um, um, security token. Uh, this uh, this trade has um, has two legs. It has a cash leg and it has a a, a, a security a piece leg. And the, the cash leg and the security leg, in in best case, they 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 come together in in in, in stand and um, or or let's say yeah atomically. If you have issues with with the cash leg and if you have to do a pre finance pre financing and the conversion thing, you're always you you always face 
whatever operational problem, credit related problems, you're always a little bit behind and this atomic swapping might either um, um, uh, uh, cause some financial issues, someone has has to do the pre-funding or has some whatever uh, latencies. So if we would have a CBDC, this trading stuff would be even more smoother than, than today and it will come. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident it will come. Now, Austin, to, to change gears again, could you tell us a little bit more about the um, the community of crypto companies and foundations that are actually working in Switzerland? Is this is there much of a community? I know just from experience that there are plenty of foundations that have decided to uh, be Swiss foundations, but what what's the discourse like? Do you do do, do these foundations talk amongst themselves? Uh, yeah, abs absolutely. Um, I think you, especially in Zurich, have a have a large concentration, and down in Zug, uh, there's a, a wide range of foundations that have, that have popped up uh, that provide support for each other and uh, and pathways. It's uh, the found the foundation structure is very interesting uh, from a um, as I mentioned earlier, sort of from a neutrality standpoint, um, you know, sort of being. Uh, not you know not not for profit right or goal based uh, is can be a hard thing to set up um, but but once you have it set up and you're you're set up for a mission it makes things much easier to operate and it takes a lot of even if you do have token holders uh, you're you're not necessarily beholden to the token holders except for the amount that you submit yourself to the token holders, right? And that, that usually is typically a process of decentralization that occurs over time. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I think that uh, the communities, you know, we'll see every, every bull and bear cycle is interesting to see how it shakes out, but uh, every, um, uh, uh, you know, spent some time last month trying to plan a conference and we wanted to have the conference one place in the U.S. and you know, the conversation basically came down to, no, the flights from Switzerland aren't very good, <laughs> right? And so we ended up having to pick a place in the U.S. that had a direct flight to Switzerland uh, because that's just where a lot of the support's coming from and where a lot of the people have chosen to put themselves because uh, that's that's where they have the, the, the most freedom to the work that they want to do. And so, um, yeah, uh, we need to we need to talk um, the airlines into having more direct flights into into Switzerland and out of Switzerland, uh, <laughs> so we can do some more things and and get there get there uh, more easily. But, yeah. Great. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it out, uh, turn it over to some audience questions. Uh, Ophelia, I'll start with you. We've got one uh, about. Uh, stable coins and about uh, what currency they should be denominated in. Uh, one person asks, you know, why is there a, U why is there a USDC, a, a US digital currency? Um, of course, this is not a CBDC. It's just a, it's a stable coin, the second largest, in, which had a, a spot of bother uh, with the US banking crisis recently, but it's still a multi-billion dollar stable coin and it's very popular. And there's not um, there's not a, a Swiss, it's a Swiss franc, I believe, right? So there's not a Swiss franc um, a, a current a stable coin, at least not one that has really taken hold. Alfie, could you give us some insight into why that might be? Sure. So a couple of things. There, there is, uh, there are uh, Swiss franc stable coins. They just typically haven't performed very well. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a few reasons for that, to be honest. I I think crypto, for whatever reason, became a dollar-denominated market. It's by far the most liquid pairs. So when you start to talk about tradability um, and trading pairs, which is a lot of what people currently use stablecoin for, um, a lot of that is happening in dollars. And the FX rates you get inside of crypto itself are not great. So if you wanted to go from USDC to a CHF stablecoin, you're going to be better off liquidating or unwrapping and going through a more traditional FX pathway because currently the FX rates just aren't great, um, especially if what your your business is trading. I think from a payments perspective, uh, it's a different question. Um, I think we haven't seen a ton of use for stablecoins as payments yet. 
there's some discussion around doing that maybe, but it, it's not the primary use case today. It's primarily a trading asset. Um, I think that will likely change over time. And I think Switzerland, partially because of the way um, Swiss payments infrastructure is set up and um, the role of six and the role of Twint and the use of digital payments um, kind of across the board in really interesting ways um, could really lend itself to that. In which case I could see a Swiss franc stable coin actually having some really unique utility to it. Um, but I think as a tradable asset until we start to see more diversification around trading pairs and better FX rates intrinsic to crypto itself, that's going to be challenging. So if it's fair to say this is not really a, uh, it's not like it's something about the Swiss franc that's an issue. It's more so just the fact that crypto denominates itself in dollar terms. And if if that's the case, then like, well, why have any other stablecoin denominated in a different fiat? I think it's just, it, it's not a question of why not. I think it's just a question of like, you're not going to have as much utility. You're not going to have as much liquidity there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not dissimilar from commodities markets, right? So think about, um, for example, there's actually pricing differentials in products between Swiss-based gold and London-based gold if, in ETF products, for example. Um, why is that? Well, it has to do partially with FX and partially to do with storage. And so it has really, it's about where's the nexus for trading certain types of assets. And, you know, I think we're seeing that shift for the first time. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw more turbulence around that in crypto markets and more diversification in fiat pairs, um, especially given the U.S.'s regulatory stance and, and particularly the U.S.'s stance on banking um, of crypto companies. So I, I wouldn't be surprised by that. But I think it will start to look a little bit more like other commodity markets where you have multiple trading pairs. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see how that plays out in commodities in the next couple of years, especially around some of the stuff that's happening today with um, petroleum and gas and uh, Russia and China. So I think there's a sort of wait and see approach to this, but I don't, I think you can draw some pretty nice corollaries between why we trade, why a lot of commodities markets are dollar denominated. Mm -hmm. I think we inherited that convention. Cool. And then uh, Marcel, over to you. We've got a question from uh, Michelle Aboud. She's asking about uh, whether it matters if a, uh, a, a a Swiss company that wants to have a token is does like let me let me rephrase. It's a bit of a meaty question, but um, if you've got a Swiss foundation that has a token, does it matter whether it's interested in deploying that token purely to a Swiss audience or rather just using Switzerland as the base to have an international uh, audience? Basically, like. If you're a Swiss company, do you need to only serve the, the like? Do you do you need to focus just on Switzerland, or can you work more broadly internationally? That, that that's by the way, uh, really a very good question. Um, we we have seen that these let's say these these topics they they are becoming more and more global. I mean, it it goes with the nature of blockchain and. Uh, also has a, an impact on on legal work so there is i would say on every second project i have a colleague from the us or a, a colleague from 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 germany covering um the the eu um the eu legal side um, that's necessary exactly to answer questions um, like the the one you have uh, presented but from a purely swiss um swiss view there is no, um, there's no need to to be um, or to target um, Swiss clients um, if if you do something, if if you do a token creation or a token issuance in, in in Switzerland. But if you do that, if 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 you intend to um, uh, to issue or to whatever um, primary market activities, they're not very much um, um, regulated. But if you um, intend to sell um, an, an issue token, talking about secondary market um, um, issues, then um, you have you have to adhere to Swiss law. And here um, it, it's quite likely that, for example, our um, MIFID-like uh, regulation kicks in, and you have to um, you have to uh, issue a prospectus or whatever a summary um, um, and base prospectus. Always depending on 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 the on the segment on the client segment you are, are targeting, 
when it is about, I mean, it also depends on the product as such. Are we really talking, or, or what are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, security uh, talk? And then it's more this uh, prospect um, area I, I was referring to. Is it something which has more payment payment character than um, the, the SRO, so the AML um, topic becomes more important? It, it can be quite likely that um, the company has to become a member of, of one of these, these uh, self-regulatory organizations here in Switzerland, where we have really more, or I would even say a free space, is the, is the utility token area. You might ask yourself, um, hey, how can I find out what I am? It, it, it's it's straightforward. Um, um, it, it is about the functionality of a token. The functionality of a token is, is decisive for, for its uh, characteristic, whether it's payment, utility, or security token. And who, who can make that sure? Um, finally, it is FINMA. FINMA can, can, can tell you what it is and, and FINMA, um, that's what I would like to mention, offers here an interesting instrument. They um, are calling it a um, non-objection letter. So we do, we're um, doing that quite often that, that we um, present a specific case to FINMA saying, hey, there's foundation intends to issue token XYZ and, and here's our legal analysis. And third, hey, here's our recommendation and um, please confirm that this specific project does not bounce with any financial market regulation. Dear FINMA, can you confirm that? And that's a good, and fin, FINMA does that or FINMA comes back and says, hey, please uh, provide a little bit more info here and there. And um, yeah, then uh, when, when they come back, you have a, a solid instrument uh, in, in, in your hand and you have quite quite some certainty where you can build on on your your company. So so the those those letters was that like a, a rough equivalent to like a no action letter in the US yeah, context? Exactly. Yeah, I would say so. Okay, cool. So that's that's good to know. Always always good to get those letters if you're a crypto company because yeah. it's it's uh, what's better than not getting sued? Getting a letter that says that you won't get sued. That's a little bit better, um, for sure. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, just encourage the audience, please pipe up with any more questions as we uh, wait to see what what that uh, brings in. Uh, Austin, I want to ask you, like, um, you know, working as a reporter in the U.S., I mean, I, I only understand the aspects of the Swiss industry that I either go out and learn myself or more often are pitched to me in my inbox. Uh, one thing that I've heard lots about are some of these, you know, organizations such as the Crypto Valley Association that uh, position themselves as going out and being a voice for uh, lots of different players. Uh, Crypto Valley, I, I believe, being a reference to Zug, is it? Um, that area? It's, um, someone fact check me? Lovely. Perfect. So, uh, Austin, I'd love to hear from you. How important are those types of organizations uh, in helping guide the Swiss crypto industry, like, is this uh, is this effort really working because it's a coordinated one, or is it more just that you know it's working for other reasons? Uh, well, that's a great question, and I wish I had had more insight. But what I can say is that I know that we we would not have gotten to where we were as quickly as we did without the help of 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 another foundation that had that had just done it recently. Um, and so I would think that those kinds of organizations that are able to lay those tracks, uh, particularly <laughs> law firms who who know the space very well, who are able to you're able to go to and say, hey, this is what I want to do. And they have, you know, again, 80 percent of the framework set up. Uh, those, those are incredibly important. Um, and, uh, you know, it's 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 sort of been a um, you know a, a point of mine to make when I when I talk to some of my friends here in the U.S. A lot of friends are they're starting crypto companies. I'm like, well, look, you, you are you sure? First of all, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna find I'm gonna do a Wyoming LLC or something or, or Dow, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe, but like you really should consider doing a Swiss foundation or you really should, you know, you know, look at doing this. I said, there's a couple issues. You got to find somebody in Switzerland that you really, 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 really trust. And, you know, you got to help you through it. And there's some steps, but compared to the cost of, 
you know, trying to navigate the U.S. system, it's it's probably cheaper uh, to buy buy a couple flights over to Switzerland and and have some meetings uh, than than to jump through all those hoops until the U.S. government can sort of get its act together and and put some reasonable regulation in place that that's easy to follow over here. It's just it's just way easier uh, to get way down the road in Switzerland. Uh, and and I think those organizations and and the more that the more that those groups can do to reach out to the U.S., I think you'll find you, you know and 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 other areas of the world you'll find some interested people who will take you up on your uh, on, on the information that you're offering and the uh, guidance that you're offering. Uh, go on. I would add to that honestly. I I I moved to Switzerland years ago um, to set up my company. Uh, with my co-founder and neither one of us is Swiss. Um, and it was interesting. Like some of the first people we talked to were Crypto Valley Association. Still do work with them. Actually quite a bit of work with them. Um, the interesting thing about crypto in Switzerland specifically, like from a community perspective, in my experience, is it's kind of everywhere. It's really embedded in a nice way. And these organizations do a lot to foster that community and to be welcoming to new people coming. It's like, I will tell you, it, you know, it's a bad joke, but, uh, you know, my, my first week in Switzerland, I didn't know how to do anything. Like I, I had never stepped foot in Switzerland before deciding I was going to build a company there. Um, on the basis of like, it made sense for us from a business perspective, but it was literally like going to my local cantonal office and being like, hi, I don't know how to file this paperwork to have a registration here. I'm 60% sure I'm currently an illegal immigrant. Can you like fix this? And the answer from the cantonal officials were, oh, why are you here? And I'm like, well, I'm starting a company. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. The response was, oh, no problem. Here's a piece of paper. I put a note in your file. They're gonna, we're gonna stop calling you. Fill this out and come back next week. We have an appointment for you. It'll be fine. You just need to do this, this, and this, and there's nothing else you need. Problem is done. That's what these types of organizations provide you with is actually help in figuring out how to do these types of things, not just where it relates to like actually crypto necessarily, but also to the extent of like, hey, what is it like to move here and build a company here? What is it like to actually have a community of people who do these things? Is there a community that you can share ideas with and actually innovate? Um, you really can't underestimate like the impact of other organizations like ETH and IC3 and the kind of research that's happening on the technical side, the kind of innovation that's happening on the legal side. It provides you with that community of people you can actually talk to day in and day out. It's your friends. It's uh, how you live your life, especially for people who are coming to Switzerland to build these kinds of projects. So like I would say, aside from like the very real impact on, on regulations and lobbying and conferences and, and, and infrastructure and, and co-working spaces and whatever else that looks like. There's also an enormous piece um, that these organizations do around community and helping you find that community, especially when you first arrive. Like I arrived by myself with my co-founder. There were two of us. We were starting a company. We had nothing um, and no connections to the country at all. And so these, these types of, um, if, if I were starting again, that's the first phone call I would make is to go and talk to them and, and get that help in, in the initial stages. Yes, I, I would imagine it's difficult to set up a company if uh, if you are deported as an illegal immigrant. So it's good to hear that the, 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 the infrastructure <laughs> yeah. and the people are there are uh, to help navigate that world. That's something that one certainly yeah. And in the end, I wasn't, that. in all fairness. I oh, was still okay. in well, my like good. 90 days, had to fill it out, but they were like, you need to fill it out in the next like three business days. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I hey, can do that. Hey, that's, it all that's worked out beautifully in the end. That, but <laughs> That's better than me. When I was when I was studying abroad in Ireland, I maybe intentionally, maybe did not, kept pushing off my um, my immigration meeting until uh, they literally forced me to 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 schedule one. Else, they would kick me out of the country. So I scheduled it for the day that I left. So one could say that I self deported. Oh, that this is going on the internet now, isn't it? That's lovely. Um, anyway, moving on, we're gonna wrap up. Now that I've outed myself as an international criminal, uh, let's just uh, run through everyone. I'd love to hear from each of you just some final thoughts on the state of crypto uh, in Switzerland. Uh, what what do we have to look forward to or to not look forward to 
uh, in the year ahead. Marcel, I'll start with you. Um, I think it's uh, becoming more and more mature. So looking at, at our clients, um, it was a little bit, as Ophelia has, has mentioned, so I, I had clients um, popping into my office in the sense, hey, Marcella, I have an idea. I would I would like to change the world. I mean, that was very fascinating and um, it has also some kind of um, enthusiastic effect. But this doesn't happen that that much anymore. So companies have become more and more mature. And your company is the best example. So we are talking about um, um, capital market, financial market um, um, topics, um, the, the, let's say the the, the, the crypto virus um, has swapped over clearly into the traditional world. Not everyone is is um, talking about that in a let's say in a very open manner. So a couple of years ago, we have seen more more news um, in this regard. This it has been uh, become a little bit more quiet, but it does not mean that there's not much um, um, stuff going on. So behind the scenes, there's a lot of of build up. There's a lot of activity, but it. it it's also good that it does not appear um, every time on, on, let's say, in the front page. Hey, there's a, a guy who who who, went, who who invented, created a new token. It it will be just done, and it will be um, uh, it, it has a connection in in a lot of cases to, let's say, the traditional traditional world. That's one thing. Uh, what I see and I really like that is that let's say this uh, initial uh, initial um, movements. Um, we took place in the financial industry. That's really good. It's a very powerful industry. But I also um, um, see that that others, other industries, are um, um, keeping up. Um, let's say commodity trading. That's a big one. It's uh, I think also yeah. We we also have clients in the pharma industry. So let's say the spectrum is is getting um, broader in terms of uh, involved industry, and it's becoming more and more mature. But the maturity does not say that. New ideas are not welcome. It's the opposite. New art ideas are highly welcomed. But I would say that the the the, the connectivity or the, the way to the traditional world is is becoming shorter and shorter, which is good. So, yeah, that that's cool. it in a nutshell. Ophelia, I think it's interesting. Um, Switzerland, in my view, actually has a right to win in crypto. Um, it's sort of Switzerland's game to lose at this stage. Uh, there's so much about Switzerland that lends itself to this. There, there's financial talent, there's technical talent, there is comprehensive, clear regulations. There's a regulator who's actually willing to work with you. There's a tradition of banking. There's a tradition of gold custody and storage. So store value goods. There's a tradition of privacy and bank secrecy. Switzerland really has a right to win here. Um, and it's remarkable because it's a unique set of combinations. And I think, interestingly, politically, Switzerland actually recognizes that. That's where the blockchain nation stuff comes from. It's because this is so aligned, so deeply aligned with what, what Switzerland stands for as a country, whether, whether it's uh, neutrality, privacy, sovereignty, democracy, uh, I mean, pretty much you name it, right? personal responsibility. I mean, we, we can keep going down the list. And I think the interesting thing and in what we're going to see in Switzerland in the coming year is there's been a narrative for many years that a lot of these things, uh, we've taken them for granted, especially in the United States. Stability of banks. Hey, fractional reserve banking, maybe something we should revisit as a concept. Um, and I think what is the role of regulators in daily life? What is the role of banks in daily life? What is your role and your responsibility in your finances? What kind of right to privacy do you really have? And I think Switzerland has spent a lot of time doing what I would perceive of as groundwork on that. And I think the global community is recognizing the value of those things for the first time in a long time. Um, and so my, my hope for Switzerland and for Swiss crypto in the next year is that people actually start to capitalize on that. Um, and, and not just in the crypto community, but I actually think this is a really powerful tool for enhancing Swiss neutrality, enhancing Switzerland's role in global financial systems, and enhancing um, Switzerland's role as like a force uh, geopolitically and financially for the rest of the world. And so I think this is what I'm hoping for from crypto and it's from crypto and, and from Switzerland in the next 
not just a year, but several years. I realize it's quite ambitious, but I really do think um, Switzerland is uniquely positioned in that way. Great. And then Austin, just to wrap up with you in a, in a minute, uh, what are you? What's your outlook for the year? Really, really quickly, it's it's you know, during the bear market you're supposed to go build, right? And so everything's sort of in turmoil right now. Now's the time to build. Switzerland's a great place to do that. There is a pathway for uh, when you look at the broad macroeconomic things that are happening right now. Uh, there's a pathway to alternate solutions in in Switzerland, um, building collaboratively, financing collaboratively. All of these things that that um, uh, the framework, the regulatory framework over there allows for that's not being allowed elsewhere is is a huge advantage. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I hope that uh, the U.S. will get its act together, the rest of the EU will get its act together, and that we'll have this this freedom to do this more broadly. But until we do, this is a great it's a great place to build and it's a great place to uh, find a find a pathway to the experimentation to get us out of some of these sticky situations that we find ourselves in now on a global scale. Great. Uh, then I will uh, end it there. I'll, I'll turn it back over to our uh, gracious hosts to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, we have to come to an end now, unfortunately. But thank you, Felia, Marcel, Austin, and also Danny for sharing your insight and experience with us on things like the Swiss regulator FINMA and also how you experience the Swiss uh, crypto uh, community here. So if you would like to explore of the audience and evaluate Switzerland in more detail, um, please get in touch with us. Um, you see here the email that you can get in touch with us also the swiss business hub in the us uh, can help you and i think we just put a couple of um, links in the chat uh, so more resources for you so with this um, thank you for joining and i wish you all a good rest of the day thank you thank you thank you thank you bye thanks everybody